Hello, I am Ray Dogum and welcome to Vibecast. Thank you for joining us as we explore the exciting advancements in technology-enabled collaboration to excel important drug development. VibeBio seeks to find every cure for every community. We think big as no one should be left behind in the pursuit of living a healthy, happy, and productive life, free from disease. Collectively, we have the skills, we have the technology, and we have the passion. We now need the community catalyst to bring it all together. That's Vibe. We see a future where communities of biopharma experts and patients collaborate to identify high potential rare disease medicines and have the ability to access capital on demand to develop them. The Vibecast is our weekly informational podcast as we explore some of the hottest topics in drug development and Web3 with some of the dynamic people that make up the Vibe community. Join us to learn, imagine, question, and help us identify and develop solutions together. Our guest today is none other than Mike Dudas. Mike is the founder and former CEO of The Block. He is co-founder of LinksDAO and also managing partner of Sixth Man Ventures, who is an early investor in Vibe Bio. Mike, thanks for joining us today. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me, Ray. I appreciate it. So if you wouldn't mind, please tell the community a little bit about yourself, your background, and what brought you here. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I've been in the crypto you know ecosystem full time for about five years, and you know my interest in cryptocurrency started about a decade ago when I discovered Bitcoin. And frankly, initially it was you know, very much focused on a you know thinking of blockchains as payments rails and you know sort of global censorship resistant, always on you know fully accessible payment rails over the past decade it's been really exciting to see new blockchains launched like ethereum solana and a number of others that have allowed for smart contracts and more programmability and as a result have created a scenario where you know blockchains can be used not only for payment applications but also for other applications uh and things like you know communities where people can vote on chain you know to affect things so that's what attracted me uh, to Vibe Bio. You know, we'll talk more about that. Uh, prior to jumping into crypto full time in 2018, I had spent a lot of time in the tech industry, working primarily on fintech. Had been at Braintree and Venmo, you know, social payments. Before that, I'd been at Google Wallet, and then before that, I was at Disney and and YouTube. So, beginning of my career was in media. So it's been really cool to see all that come together, and uh, what we call you know call Web3 or your know, crypto communities or whatever you you know want to call them, but just a mixture of you know the, the sort of fintech and, and payment rails and um, you know value combined with the the media and community uh, and application technology aspect. Uh, so it's been a really exciting time. And uh, yeah, you you mentioned the things that I've worked on specifically in the crypto space over the last five years. Um, and today, you know, my primary job is to invest so to to work with. You know, phenomenal teams and founders like the folks at Vibe Bio, um, as they bring you know these really emergent um, you know, applications and communities to the masses. I appreciate that very much. And you know, it's interesting how when the cryptocurrency sort of uh, revolution sort of started, we can say uh, the whole idea behind Bitcoin was primarily about payments and things like that. When Ethereum came out, there was this idea of smart contracts and the world decentralized computer, right, running with smart contracts. And now we're in this world of NFTs and DAOs and even more capabilities with blockchain. And I often tend to imagine what's the future of, of blockchain as well. And, and what do you think about, you know, looking at some of the experience you have, uh, you have successful DAOs, and I'm sure you've been involved with some failures of DAOs too. And uh, you've probably learned a lot about those as well. So maybe the question is like, what do you see in the future for, for blockchain and DAOs? And what are we expecting um, in that way? Yeah, so I think we're, you know, so we're at the very, very earliest stages of, um, you know, the development of DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. Most of what we've seen to date that is branded as, you know, a air quote DAO, you know, isn't all of those things, isn't fully decentralized, autonomous, um, <laughs> or or organized. Um, the the reality is it's really difficult uh, to conduct governance against you know complex you know, problems and opportunities um you know with you know, purely on chain decentralized voting like we just haven't you know, I think we're only probably what like six seven years into people thinking deeply about this problem and experimenting with it so um to your question like what is the future well 
you know, I think hopefully the future is finding really, um, you know, promising uh, organizational and governance design that allows these, uh, you know, quote unquote experiments to turn into successful, um, you know, truly decentralized projects where you truly have, you know, instead of a top-down corporate oriented um, decision-making structure to basically make things happen, you have more of a you know, bottoms up, you know, everybody involved in governance and able to propose things model that proves to work. Um, where we are in that process today is like, you know, DAOs in their purest sense, where they're like decentralized autonomous organizations tend to really only happen in, you know, very tight contexts from what I've seen, like you know, specifically like investment DAOs or something that looks like there's some emerging work where it's just like very simple, like, hey, let's vote on buying X and, you know, we're spending money on Y and he, you know, somebody can put a proposal up and then people sort of vote in proportion to their amount of tokens held on, you know, whether that investment should happen. There's, if you go a little further out than just pure investing, there's um, some emergent, you know, interesting success and early success in uh, DeFi or decentralized finance DAOs, um, you know, where you have, for example, like a borrow lend protocol like Compound or Aave. And, you know, the the folks can hold what's called a governance token and they can sort of vote on things like, hey, what collateral you know, should be used um, or accepted in this borrow lend protocol and, you know, what levels of collateral are necessary for this type of loan and things like that. Um, how should fees accrue, you know, to people who are securing, you know, the protocol, things like that. Very straightforward things. I think as you get into more complex tasks, like that actually do require, um, you know, maybe more focused and specific leaders that get uh, and, and you know, decision makers and expertise, um, including things like Vibio, where you need like scientists and medical experts and doctors and folks of that nature. Um, you know, we're in, again, untested ground in terms of how do you encourage um, community participation? How do you encourage meaningful votes? How do you affect them? Uh, how do you structure, you know, the voting power? And then, you know, how do you, at the same time that you're, you're taking the, the power and benefits of the community, actually, again, affect, um, you know, change, like things like drug discovery and development. Um, again, getting to the purest form of the name, decentralized autonomous organization, that's a really complex uh, thing to do. So um, what I foresee for the next few years is more, experimentation, um, and probably, you know, more air quotes DAO than, you know, the on-chain pure uh, representation of them. Absolutely. And and part of the issue, I think, that the industry is facing now is the tooling and the software for the back end of DAOs simply don't exist in the way that they do for centralized platforms. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people are working on. And I think it'll get much better very quickly however we're not there yet because we've been doing centralized internet for at least 20 years right um or so so maybe can you talk to me about some of the design characteristics you'd like to see in a DAO, specifically around you know how to solve for um voting and voter concentration issues can you share a little bit about that yeah so I think, you know, you asked a couple things there. You made a couple points. One is around tooling, and then one is around governance design. And I, yeah, they're two different things. So what I would say is, I think the where you finished with that question, you know, sort of the human element and, and design is truly the crux of ultimately what is going to make these things work or not work. And then the, because you can't even develop tooling to support so effectively what we've had historically is a structure a social structure that uh, of of basically you know affecting business change that people understand um and of conducting business and that's like the corporation right and you have shareholders and you have a corporate structure and a board and you know you appoint executives and hire them and they like do things and like over time you know over the last couple of centuries like that form of enterprise and of common enterprise like developed and was refined right um and then 
you know, I think second to that, like the legal form and the corporate form, eventually over time, you had, again, tools and, and you know, things of that nature to allow people to do their jobs better. Um, so the area that we find ourselves in today with tooling is like, I don't even know that we have, we certainly don't have enough broad scaled success stories of DAOs, you know, accomplishing big tasks and affecting, you know, really ambitious goals. As I mentioned, you know, I think there's some in investments and, and then in you know, decentralized finance and you know, there's increasingly some <clears throat> that look like they might succeed in community, like pure community and social aspects, but it's hard to develop tools until you know how, you know, the organizations will be designed. And then I think the tools can sort of act in service of that design. So to the second question on, you know, how do you structure and design and governance? Um, you know, it, 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 one, it depends. Like it's, it's really dependent on the type of thing that folks are trying to achieve. So I think a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO is a much more, is a much broader catch-all than a corporation is, right? Than like a traditional company or business. Um, you know, you have companies, you have nonprofits, you have like affinity groups, like you have all kinds of legal and, uh, and you know, um, organizational structures that people have used throughout the last couple centuries and even before that to accomplish common goals. Because yeah, as I mentioned in some of my examples, we have financial services DAOs, we have community and social DAOs, we have DAOs now trying to accomplish things that corporations maybe haven't done as well. Things like what BioBio is doing, where you know, hey, the biotech or the you know drug industry isn't necessarily in developing drugs for everyone. So hey, maybe we need a new structure to incentivize that. Um, so 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 to your question, I think that the first thing is. Um, Less about tooling and more about, I think we need like clarity on the assets and the incentives. So the things that will cause people to have incentives to act within these organizations, um, which, you know, today they're tokens, right? And like today, those tokens are emergent. Yeah, I think there's a lack of regulatory clarity in the United States and some other countries about, you know, what the... Um, classification of those things are, how they can be issued, who they can be issued to, what their use and purpose can be. Um, so it's really, di it's difficult. It's difficult to think through, you know, governance and design and incentives. Um, I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest and first steps is, is really getting clarity around um, tokens. And I think, so that's people who are proponents of this, you know, of this way of organizing communities and organizing against objectives, talking to, you know, the right legal and, and government folks. I think that's one of the, the biggest things that we need to do. Um, you know, assuming that we can get some clarity there, then you move on to the next thing, was, which is like incentive and, and mechanism design. Um, and I think the principles there that you want are, you know, certainly how are you inclusive? How do you make the votes like impactful so that people participate and care. So you want inclusiveness, you want them like to really everybody to be represented and uh, and truly have the ability to have a vote or a say. Otherwise, like there's no point in having any structures. You want people to care. So you need like broad reach and some level of reasonable quorum so that the community is actually represented. Um, you need a reason to vote. So you need really clear I think where a lot of these organizations have fallen down to date is not having really clear objectives. Like people have no idea why they're participating. Um, I think that's where Vibe and, and DSI can be really interesting because it's actually exceptionally clear what the ultimate goal is, which is like drug develop discovery development and you know release um, to solve very specific medical problems and disease issues. Like it's very specific. So I, you know, I think a lot of existing call it experiments or community struggle to actually define what they're doing. So clarity around that. Um, and then, you know, yeah, purpose. And I think um, the other thing is uh, just having a crystal clear structure of, of how like the organization part of it, because again, decentralized autonomous organizations, well, the way decisions are made, 
you know, is, is objective, uh, sorry, is, is ideally, you know, going to be participatory and fair and, you know, incentivized through different mechanisms. Um, you know, there, there has to be some level of, of, you know, organization that makes sense to folks. And then, um, yeah, I don't think we've really nailed on that yet. And to your, to then get back to the original point you made on tooling, you know, the, the biggest thing that I think is, is holding us back from that is, is purpose-built communication tools, um, you know, for, discussion, awareness, uh, and then human sort of collaboration and and um, and debate around the things, you know, being discussed. So much of that happens like offline and in tiny groups and, you know, in ways that isn't captured and really a spirit that's different than how organizations have run historically. Thanks for that. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. I think having a clear purpose and objectives definitely helps. And also the incentives need to be clear and purpose designed for those individuals that are participating or that you want to participate. So in our case with Vibe Bio, for example, you know, we certainly want patients to be part of that participation. We want um, biopharma, biotech researchers to be part of that as well. So, you know, we need to think very clearly about what can incentivize these folks and how can we design something that is scalable, you know, not something that'll work for a few weeks, but something that can work for um, months and years in time and build something and then test it out. Like you said, these are all sort of experiments in this phase of technology adoption. Um, do you have any sort of ideas about how to incentivize, for example, um, you know, a biopharma researcher to share one of their proposals with the community, for example, you know, we've been thinking a lot about this internally as well, uh, but just interested in maybe your, approach. Yeah. So I haven't thought like deeply and specifically about that problem. I would generalize it more to, um, you know, what gets folks, what would encourage folks to, um, you know, to share anything, uh, with, with anyone, you know, of, of, you know, value. And I think the, so there's obvious ones, right? Like there needs to probably be some like incentive that ties to what that person's focus is, whether it be financial, whether it be prestige. Um, but ultimately, you know, a biotech researcher who discovers something, you know, they want the thing that they're trying to affect their number one incentive uh, is I want like this discovery to be, you know, successful and solve problems at scale. I, I, I would imagine, right? Like the vast majority of people, that's what they're motivated by you know, in the area that they specialize in, they want the fruits of their work to reach and impact, you know, a really significant number of people or a small number of people in a really significant ways, so a maximum impact. So I think that the biggest thing that you, like Vibe and, you know, others can stress today is, okay, what, what does the path of working with you, you know, how does it maybe differ than a traditional path? Is it, you know, a faster realization of the goal? Is it more, you know, input and support and almost like, you know, a reference and test um, customer, you know, is it faster development? Like, you know, you just have to basically lay out. But I, I think the number one thing is like some compelling uh, vision of how you can help that research turn into reality you know, faster and then, or, you know, at greater scale than through a more traditional path combined with an incentive likely, you know, like whether it's a token, whether it's a dollar grant, you know, things like that um, to remunerate somebody for, you know, the effort they're putting in. You know, that's interesting. Um, one thing you said in there was they might be incentivized through like financial instruments, some sort of like uh, tokens or something like that. But the other side of the token is the prestige part. So like reputation for discovering potentially a, a new molecule. Um, and in the, the DeFi space and the crypto space, there's a lot of reputational stuff happening. So um, I don't know if you want to like share your thoughts on how, yeah. how important reputation is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I think it's proven in pretty much any group, right? Profession, community. I mean, it's, it's something that people valued throughout the history of time, right? Like, you know, any individual identifies as, you know, X number of things, you know, I've got, uh, 
maybe my like nationality, my gender, my race, my um, you know, religion, my profession, my family, these things. So, you know, and they want to uh, amongst some subset of those groups that they really focus on and that like matter to them. Um, like uh, most people I've met, like this is just a sort of social observation or human observation, um, really gravitate towards um, the approval of others, right? Uh, which manifests itself in many ways, but one is prestige or like lauded for your accomplishments in a specific thing or your ideas, right? Accomplishments or and or ideas. Um, so, you know, amongst in, in like DeFi for your, your, you know, in your example, you know, things that <clears throat> bestow prestige are really like developing really interesting algorithms, you know, approaches to a specific mathematical problem that could lead to more capital efficiency, more secure systems, um, you know, better performance uh, in terms of speed or throughput, uh, things of that nature, discovering, you know, big vulnerabilities and protecting people. Uh, and so, yeah, you not everybody in the DeFi community, decentralized finance community, despite it being a you know financial ecosystem, are primarily or you know, purely or even primarily in some cases driven. Many of the most impactful people aren't necessarily driven, you know, solely or even major, you know, primarily by money, but by a mission, right? So that's the other thing. I said prestige, but it ties to also there's just like people who are mission driven. By the way, mission ties to what we were talking about earlier with just like having the thing in drug discovery reach as many people as possible, that molecule, that thing that you discover having big impact. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just been proven um, to matter. Like people, uh, I think what you have in the crypto space today actually is like some people who I think are the most quote unquote powerful or wealthy who people view as maybe having done it, not through in many, in some cases, you know, the most sort of ethical or, um, you know, uh, yeah, I would say like ethical or, or, you know, maybe value creating for the greater good um, and just like society at large, but accruing financial value themselves. And they're just like, kind of like cast out. And so it's like, okay, cool. You have all that money, but like, nobody really cares. Like go enjoy yourself. So uh, I think as we move into quote unquote web three, and as we move into areas like DCI, like I, I do think that the social elements are going to matter in a more outsized way to folks. Interesting. So again, you have been in DeFi for some time. Why start looking at DeSci and investing in DeSci? Yes. I believe so, in this. so I think that the, you know, our whole, uh, my whole approach is that we have an entire set of centralized financial and non-financial um you know, applications, entities, et cetera, that uh, are, I think, leaving room for other designs to do things more successfully than them. So in the financial realm, it's like government combined with banks equals money and, you know, the, finan the financial system. That's how it's been for, you know, certainly the last century. Um, since we moved to the you know, fiat money system. And you know, I think it's really healthy to have an alternative to that, particularly as we move towards you know, a more authoritarian world and a world of political censorship and you know, things of that nature. So started there, you know, that's really where crypto started. And I think moving from there to other problems is, is very sensible. Like I think this notion of uh, decentralized organizations is going to clearly touch more and more um, areas, you know, things like science, things like social communities and how we spend our time, things like, you know, transportation, you know, you name it, but like any really large complex system that, you know, currently call it is like dominated by you know, centralized corporations or infrastructure, I think has the potential not to be completely, you know, call it put out of business or replaced by, you know, these emergent community or, you know, group driven models, but, but certainly a nice alternative to them and a way to experiment and see if they can uh, deliver better outcomes. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It'll eventually reach all industries um, at some point in some way, right? Um, you know, I was reading the other day that the biotech industry globally is around five hundred billion dollars or something like that. And then I read somewhere else that the attention economy is also worth around the same amount. So um, uh, those numbers don't quote me on them, but kind of like similar to those numbers. Isn't that interesting? Like the attention economy, something that didn't exist, you know, 20, 30 years ago, is yep. now such a big, important role in our lives. <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. The amount of time we spend on the attention economy and, and gaming, you know, um, exactly. You know, largely didn't exist 50 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So we've talked about some of the benefits of DAOs um, and also some of the issues and risks there too. But one particular issue that we want to talk about now is uh, the liability that DAO participants may hold just by being part of a DAO. Um, so maybe you want to share about what kind of risk they might be taking, given that it's still early in this adoption phase and regulations haven't caught up to us, caught up to, I guess, the industry yet or the technology really. Um, so any thoughts there? Yeah. So I'll caveat by saying I'm not a lawyer uh, and, you know, in running my own, you know, projects with folks and participating in communities that I participate in, uh, you know, look, it, all of this stuff is exceptionally fluid. Um, so you know, what I would say is, TBD. Uh, yeah. And so what I would say is like, it's really incumbent upon the, the folks who I think are the call, call it the creators of these DAOs, you know, at, at their Genesis launch to really think deeply, deeply and thoughtfully and have like really strong, um, you know, advice from knowledgeable counsel uh, about how to ensure, yeah, that you structure things in a way to the best of your ability that like prevents yeah individual liability for people who participate you know in these DAOs. like you can imagine a world where a drug gets developed there's some issue and you know somebody wants to sue you have to have a structure where you know the individual members of the DAO who voted for x y or z like aren't liable right um, the structure that I've seen employed today is kind of what we talked about where, you know, you don't have, you have air quotes DAOs, which is kind of like wrapping the community governance and voting aspect of these organizations, like either inside or under a corporate structure, you know, either a limited liability or you know, some other type of corporate structure that actually puts the liability at the like corporate level and not at the individual level. Yeah, I would definitely, so I think everybody should like look and ask questions about that, particularly if you're planning to participate in, you know, governance of things that like have real world implications, um, financial or otherwise, like, you know, the, the U.S. regulatory bodies have, I think, taken some, started to, you know, started proceedings against specific, you know, financial DAOs and things like that. And in cases where there wasn't, you know, some sort of a concrete structure or wrapper around it uh they're at least trying to maybe make the case uh i think there's one called uki uki dao um i actually forget exactly how that's spelled where you know they basically served like dozens of members of the actual dao itself uh but i i practically i don't think that's something that the individual dao participant in most cases will need to you know really consider or deal with uh, assuming that things are structured correctly by the you know project, uh, the folks who have sort of created the project. Interesting. Yeah, understood. Question, more personal question for you, I guess. What is it that drives you and motivates you to to do all this, participate in these DAOs, and and really like try to help other organizations further their mission? Yeah. So I've uh, so one, I'm a really social being, and so I, I really do think that this notion of groups of people, you know, who are fluid and don't necessarily have very specific roles in all cases, you know, or can move between roles and, and don't have a hierarchy can, can accomplish things. Um, I've 
I've never really enjoyed hierarchies myself, either when I was an individual contributor at the bottom of them or when I was somebody starting a company and having to put an hierarchy in place. Um, yeah, I don't like managing huge teams of people myself. I don't like doing like tons of like formal one-on-ones and performance reviews and all that kind of stuff. I do absolutely care about a culture of like accountability and output and accomplishment, but you know, not in the context of the way I think, you know, many corporations are broken today in terms of certainly how they treat the participants, you know, and then that has a reflection on what the output is. Uh, Certainly tech where I've worked, we've seen that, right. You kind of have like these powerless armies of drones, like working at these corporations, faceless and nameless. And then the output is like a lot of these like broken products as we've seen with like Facebook and Google and you know, Amazon and Twitter and like just a lot of things that work, but like have really criticized for the way they work and the impact they have in society. So yeah, like in the same way that like I was interested originally in Bitcoin because of its ability to sort of act as a countervailing force potentially in another option uh, and a way to solve problems separate from banks and, and fiat out money. I think that DAOs, you know, certainly present and community, frankly, community driven projects. I'm not even sure DAO is the right name, to be honest, uh, in the way that like NFT is probably a crappy name for a, you know, digital asset that's unique. Um, the, or an asset that is unique, scarce, and lives on a blockchain. Like these names, I think, will change over time. So, yeah, I, like I don't think community is a BS buzzword. I think it's real and it manifests itself differently in each organization. Um, but it's just so critical and important to driving different outcomes than what we've historically driven, um, you know, with top-down hierarchical uh, and often like government-driven regulated uh, behavior. Very interesting. Yeah, you mentioned how like NFTs, the name NFT isn't even uh, probably as catchy as something else. And I thought of how Starbucks now with their new rollout of their community program uh they use stamps that's the term that they, they have um embedded so that's pretty interesting and i think maybe for vibe bio for others as well there could be some unique names models we can follow um so we're just about wrapping up here are there any specific companies or other projects that you think is worth mentioning um maybe that you know six man ventures is looking into that you'd like to share um so you know I would say candidly, we're in a place where we're, it, so you're aware of like the state of the market we're talking in February, 2023. Um, in the DAO space where we're really focused is just doubling down and supporting the companies that we've invested in and the projects and the protocols and the people over the past you know 12 to 15 months. The, the reason is a lot of them have gone from idea phase to early emergent phase to like community development. So we're kind of like, for that sector of the market, for DAOs, I wouldn't say that I'm like deeply and actively looking for a ton of additional investments right now. What I'm looking for is how can we work with the teams that we've supported to date, you know, Vibio, um, there's another company called Serve that operates uh, in the sort of privacy and security and data space that we've backed. A number of other, you know, DAOs themselves, and then what, what you referred to as DAO tooling, so like credential issuing, things like Gateway and Rabbit Hole and Layer 3 and a bunch of others. So it's working with communities themselves, you know, with Lynx DAOs, you mentioned the golf community that, that I helped start. Uh, and then the, the call it tooling and infrastructure and figuring out what the heck's going to make these things scale to, you know, 100x the people reached and impacted you know, significant more participation and and therefore impact. And then following from that, hopefully, you know, revenue and profits and wonderful, you know, outcomes for the world. But that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, and I think the one area that is interesting within that sphere where we're seeing some interesting companies, but really haven't seen anybody per, perfectly put it together and done a tremendous, like that we haven't put money to work is like the whole notion of, community conversations, engagement, marketing, you really, really focus there to find like the the sweet spot. Um, because I think there's a lot of DAOs and communities out there that are kind of like, and I don't want to name any specifically, but just they've kind of like petered out or like lost the magic. People have moved on, the hype's gone. And so 
you know, how with the next cycle, as more interested people come into this crypto economy and, and want to participate, you know, as, as things come back into favor over the next 12 to 18 months, how do we make sure that there's, you know, kind of like sustainable um, projects, you know, systems and processes to support yeah, them engaging again stuff done. Mike Dudas, thank you so much for the deep dive into the DAO landscape and among other topics we covered today. So really do appreciate your time. Thank you again. Appreciate it, Ray. Thank you.